Today I'm going to talk to you about precision medicine and the huge opportunities for the technology community to partner up with a bioscience community to start making things a little bit more personal for folks that are dealing with disease. You got a lot of biotech in your backyard. The opportunities are explosive. <clears throat> so everybody's heard of this inconvenient truth. Whether you believe in global warming or not, right? But there's another inconvenient truth that is global in nature. And it's driving countries all over the world to wake up and take action. And that's aging. Okay, turn of the century, not a single country with more than 25% of their population at 60 years old and up, right? Worldwide on average, about 10% of the population was at 60 years old and older. How do you think this picture changes in 2050? Here's what the predictions are, right? That 10% worldwide average goes up north of 20% of the world's population will be over 60. Two billion people on the planet are gonna be over 60 years old. Next year alone in 2017, the predictions are that for the first time in human history, the amount of people over 60 will be more than the amount of people under five. So what happens to rapidly aging populations? They get sicker, right? More cardiovascular disease, more neurodegenerative disease, diabetes, other disorders. Health care costs also rise, right? Every single country right now is trying to figure out, how am I going to rein in my health care costs? If I don't rein them in, how am I even going to pay for pensions for my people, right? Cancer. Cancer rates go up when people get older. It's the number two killer worldwide after cardiovascular disease. A new study from the UK this year said that if you were born in 1960 or later, which I imagine most of you are, your lifetime risk of being diagnosed with cancer is one in two. So look at the person sitting next to you, right? One of you are likely to have to deal with this in your lifetime. And you might have already, right? So what does the standard of care for cancer look like today? If you start with the scalpel on the upper left-hand side, it's basically doctors' attempts to try to cut, burn, poison, and starve the cancer from your body. Right? That's the standard of care today. Many of these treatments, these traditional treatments, have been around for decades. Surgery's been around for centuries. The Romans tried to cut cancer out of people's bodies. Right? Sometimes this works. But these traditional treatments, they're built on average Joe and average Jane, right? They don't really take into consideration that every one of us are unique. Every one of us are different. Cancers, any particular cancer is going to behave differently in one person than it will in another person as well. And some of these treatments, they cause some pretty harsh side effects, right? I mean, they might extend your life, but it doesn't mean that they extend the quality of your life. Now, I'm not just saying this because, you know, I read a lot about cancer and that I talk to a lot of people with cancer or that I'm the director of marketing at Intel's health group. I'm also saying this because I live with it. So this is me. I got the 1980s Kimosabi rock and roll outfit on. And on this particular day, I went around and I took... Uh, Moonstruck Chocolate, it's a, gourmet, it's a handmade, you know, chocolate company in Portland. Uh, and I went around and I distributed it to all my, my friends in the infusion chairs. And I had one guy look up at me and he's like, you work here? Are you part of the entertainment? And I pointed to the IV in my arm and I said, no, I'm just like you. But I really wish I wasn't, right? So I have metastatic prostate cancer. I joined the Prostate Cancer Club, like 233,000 others, in 2014. This disease kills 30,000 people a year, right? I know a little bit about some of those treatments that I talked about earlier. I had surgery, didn't work, left me with some side effects that I still have today. I had chemo, yeah, it might have stopped my cancer for about nine months, but I went through five to six months of chemo-induced sickness, and I have neuropathy in my feet that is semi-permanent. I don't know if it's ever going to go away. 
when I mentioned about starving cancer, some cancers like prostate cancer, they feed off of testosterone. So we cut my testosterone off. So I, I kind of find it funny when I look at the late night infomercials, right, of the two billion testosterone therapy business. You got the guy looking at me in the, in the, on the TV and he's like, have you lost your energy? Have you kind of lost your, your ability for promotions? Do you want to regain your, your former self? Maybe you're low T. Low T, shit, I'm no T, right? So we need to move beyond this era of just spinning the wheel of trial and error treatments, right? Where decisions are made based on no knowledge of you as an individual. We need to get to a new era. The one size fits all thing doesn't work anymore, right? We need to get to the era where we can understand you, whoever has cancer, and the unique genetic abnormalities that fuel that cancer. That's the only way we're going to know. If you get to the code and the DNA, understand what's actually driving it. Now, this isn't an, an entirely new concept. This has been going on for a while. There's a new, can or a new taxonomy of cancer that's starting to emerge, right? So, you know, it's not so much what is the tumor of origin, breast cancer, prostate cancer, it's what's fueling it today. If you look at the top left-hand side, lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, it's a variety of different diseases. It's not one disease anymore. If your cells are growing fast because you've got too much epidermal growth factor receptors on those cells, we got to stop that. If your lung cancer is growing because you've got too much association with an ALK protein, you got to stop that. You, if you don't know the underlying genetic abnormalities of your cancer, you're not going to stop it. And you're going to continue to spend a bunch of money trying to stop it. Cancers evolve. They morph and mutate over time. Breast cancer, right? Today, we classify breast cancer by hormone receptors, HER2 positivity, right? Okay, so a woman gets her breast tumor taken out, and they do genomic sequencing of it, and they find out that she's HER2 positive. We're finding out now that about a fourth of women who have metastatic disease, the metastatic disease is HER2 negative, right? So if you go after a targeted therapy to stop the HER2 positive tumor, you're not doing anything about the metastatic disease that might be HER2 negative, right? So you have to sequence these people and really understand what's fueling their cancer continuously. Now, can technology and bioscience come together to kind of solve this and to make things more personal for people? Yeah, but we got to go beyond just sequencing 1% of the population today. Only 1% of cancer patients today are getting whole genome sequence or even whole exome sequencing where we can understand all the different mutations that that person has so we can take action on it. We have to move beyond that. This is a big data problem, right? You sequence one individual and it's roughly a terabyte of data, right? 200,000 MP3 songs worth of data. If you were to sequence all new cancer patients that are getting diagnosed in the United States this year, you would generate more than four exabytes of data. This is an exascale problem, right? That's 18 zeros. Five exabytes is equivalent to all words ever spoken by humans. So genomic data is truly the biggest of big data. It's going to emerge in the next 10 years. This report came out this year that in 10 years' time from now, if you look at the data acquisition, storage, analytics, the acquisition, digestion, all of this stuff, the data needs of this is likely going to outgrow YouTube and Twitter, right? Huge opportunities if, you, if the technology folks in the room here can start innovating around this space. Like I said, we've got to move beyond 1%, right? So, any given hospital, look at like Sloan Kettering, the largest hospital in the United States. They might say, oh, you know, no, I don't have to sequence more than 1%. I, I've, if I sequence all my people in my hospital, I'll be in good shape. You sequence all the people in, in Sloan Kettering, it's just 1% of the entire population of cancer people in the United States. It's not enough. You've got to give researchers a bigger pool of data so they can have bigger opportunities to make life-changing life discoveries that will turn cancer into a manageable disease. So what do the steps look like? If we want to really get to like precision medicine, if we want to get to a place where we're really addressing this, what are the technology steps involved today? I'll try to quickly go through this. So today, the first step, primary analysis, sequencing, right? 
Take some blood, do the DNA sequencing of that to come up with what your normal looks like. Get your tumor, do sequencing of that. Then now you have DNA sequencing of your tumor, DNA sequencing of your normal, and you have to compare the two. This is huge data. This is long pairs of strands of DNA, three billion base pairs of A's, C's, T's, and G's, right? Huge. They cut this thing up into like millions of different pieces, and then they spit it out with these sequencers. The first human genome took about two decades to actually, you know, to, to sequence. It was about, I don't know, a dozen or so countries, hundreds of engineers. It cost about $3 billion. Today, with innovation like Illumina's HiSeq 10, Illumina's in your guys' backyard, right? They're HiSeq 10. When genomic sequencing centers use this in volume, they can crank out a sequence of a, pay, of a, of a human genome in a day for about a thousand bucks, right? It's revolutionizing the space. But now you have to take all of this data and you have to align it and you have to start looking at variants. So like, how is this different? I, I string together the normal, I string together the tumor, I've got to look for what's different. I've got to do variant calling, I've got to map it against libraries that I have. This process takes weeks today, right? And then the last step of precision medicine, where we really understand the genes that are causing disease and the pathways, and we can make a decision you know, for that individual where we're actually comparing them against other people that look just like them, and we look at the treatments, and we look at the outcomes, and we say, we think this is gonna work. That doesn't exist today. It really doesn't. Leading edge oncologists get on the phone and they say to their friends, like uh, Brian Drucker, a famous oncologist in OHSU, he'll get on the phone to his friends at Dana-Farber and he'll say, I think I've got somebody with a very rare leukemia send me all of the samples, tumor samples of people that look just like this person that you have, because I'm gonna sequence them and see if I can find a driver mutation. This is phone calls and faxes and FedExes, it takes months, right? We need to go faster as an industry. We need to get this done in a day, right? This is the challenge that we're setting for the industry and we wanna see the technology industry come together and get to a point where you can go into the hospital in the morning get a diagnosis based on your molecular abnormalities among other data, walk out of the hospital at the end of the day with a targeted treatment plan that we know will work. And at Intel, the company I work for, we're working on a number of these fronts to get us there. One of the things we're doing is, again, we're working with the genomic sequencing companies like Illumina. Illumina, just in the four years, the throughput has just went through the roof. 25 times, 25x improvement in throughput. We work with Dell and BioTeam and a number of, of, uh, of OEMs to create these genomic appliances that are basically racks of compute and network and storage and software that are able to take the secondary analysis, which is all these genomics codes, and make them run faster. And believe it or not, you know, Intel's, everybody thinks of us as a chip company, but we do a lot of training. We get biologists and computer scientists together to, to really look at workload characterization and architectural enhancements that need to be done in order to make this stuff better. We send our social scientists out in the field to do ethnographic studies, talking to clinicians and, and, and cancer patients, right, around, around genomic sequencing. But there's a lot of computing challenges that still need to be addressed, right? Size, I mentioned how big this data is. You can't move this data around, right? It's too big. Right now, we can't, we can't do it. So we gotta figure out a way to not be moving data around, but let's move the analytics, right? The speed. Yes, we've made incredible improvements in the genomics uh, codes and making them run faster, but if we're gonna get to all in a day, this process, you know, we went from three days to one day by optimizing codes. We need to get down this to two hours, right? Secure sharing. Do you think that you know, if we want to share this data, do you think anybody's going to, you know, let's say there's a, a, a company that's hosted today in Scale Matrix that has a bunch of genomic data. Do you think the team here at Scale Matrix is going to open up the data center and say, yeah, come on in, copy and paste my, my data, go take it, have at it, you know? No, that's not going to happen. We have to figure out a way to enable secure sharing that still protects IP and the privacy of data. And scalability is going to be a huge issue, right? 
1% of people have been sequenced today. Wait till that gets to 10%, 20%, 30%. The amount of data that's gonna blow up that we're gonna need to figure out how to store efficiently and then how to do in-data processing of this, you know, this kind of sparse matrix data, we're gonna need all of your help to figure this out. 4% of the patient data, 4% of data today is derived from clinical trials, people that are in clinical trials. That data is made available for research. 96% of data is stuck in institutions. It's too big to move, it's protected. We need to come to this new era where we can achieve better results by doing collaborative analytics on this data, right? We need to be able to enable researchers to orchestrate their research from center to center and do what they need to by looking at sequencing data, looking at treatments, looking at outcomes so we can make better decisions on behalf of people. One of the things that we're doing at Intel with our partners uh, that we announced in September is, and OHSU is the, uh, the partner that we've really built this up with. They got a billion dollars as part of the night cancer um, challenge that they just hit. They're gonna become a major player in precision medicine. And we've worked on this thing called the Collaborative Cancer Cloud. So the concept of this is basically addressing a lot of those challenges that I just talked about. It enables a researcher to orchestrate their research from center to center, right? And it's gonna enable oncologists to go in and say, who is just like my patient? Who looks like them genomic, from a genomic sequencing perspective? What treatments have you given? And what are the outcomes, right? So to give you an example of how this would work, let's say a researcher wants to run a shared application like MuteSig, which looks at the significance of mutated genes that are occurring more often than normal. They run this shared application, and we have this thing in the middle, this, this trust orchestrator, that says, yeah, you're good, you're a legitimate researcher, you're authenticated. They put that application out there, a secured containers wrapped around it, it goes from site to site, does the analytics that it needs, and then just that data, the insights are sent back. It's a pretty, pretty innovative thing. We've got it up and running as a technical proof point between us and a couple of labs that we've set up. And we're gonna see this extending to two more major cancer institutions in Q1. We're gonna to begin to open some of the components so, research, you know, so other hospitals can start downloading this stuff and start to play. And we expect dozens of institutions to start creating their own clouds and then start connecting into public data sources as well. <clears throat> and this doesn't have to just start and end with cancer, right? Any disease that's discoverable by DNA could apply for this type of collaborative analytical model, right? So if you're an innovator out there and you're seeing this and you're like, look, this is the next big data movement, right? This is the biggest of big data. I want to do what I can to help drive this space. Get involved. Address some of these challenges. Help us get there. And I thought I'd end on a little bit on where I'm at in this whole precision medicine thing. So I got off the wheel, right? I'm not spinning the the trial and error wheel of treatments anymore. I said, screw that. I'm gonna go get genomic sequenced. I found out where my abnormalities are and I was able to get on a clinical trial that's going after that specific mutation that I have. So it's not a shotgun chemo anymore, it's a rifle approach, right? It's enabling me to get a treatment and not have a lot of side effects. I've been doing it for nine months, no new lesions, existing lesions are starting to die. So precision medicine works. So if you know people doing this, get involved. Thank you.